Well, welcome everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Hadley German, and I'm the Eugene B. Adkins Curator at the Fred Jones Junior Museum of Art. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the gallery talk for Kiowa Agency Stories of the Six. This program is a webinar, so your microphones and your cameras are automatically turned off. This means you can eat, you can do your dishes, and no one will know. So please um, just relax and enjoy the program. If you have a question or a comment for the panelists tonight, please type that in the Q&A box that is located, should be at the bottom of your Zoom window or on the side. The panelists will address your questions following the program. Before we get started, I wanna take a moment and acknowledge on behalf of the museum and the curators, the Osage and Wichita peoples on whose ancestral land Kiowa Agency is located. With the university, the museum fully recognizes, supports, and advocates for the sovereign rights of all of Oklahoma's 39 tribal nations. That said, I want to also take a moment and especially welcome family members and descendants of the Kiowa Six who have joined us tonight. We are honored by your presence. We hope that you will participate in the discussion. And I look forward to getting to know each of your families better and discovering how the museum might best serve you in the future. Finally, we want to thank the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, whose generosity has nurtured the study of Native American art at OU and made this exhibition possible. For those of you who don't know, Kiowa Agency Stories of the Six is a rather unique exhibition. It was curated by Jack, excuse me, curated by three students enrolled in a Mellon Foundation seminar in museum studies taught by W. Jackson Rushing this past spring. Despite the pandemic, the students, Olivia Von Gries, Mariah Ashbacher, and Julia Harth, all managed to conduct research and curate an exhibition that draws on the collections of the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art and that of the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City. This exhibition focuses on the lives and achievements of six Kiowa artists who painted at OU between 1927 and 1929, and whose work undoubtedly influenced a century of Native American art. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first of the three student curators who will be uh, speaking with you tonight, Olivia Von Gries. Olivia is a master's student focusing on modern and contemporary Native American art in OU's art history program. As an undergraduate, she attended the University of Iowa, where she earned degrees in studio art and art history. She will receive her MA from OU next spring and will be sharing tonight about Lois Smokey and Jack Hokia. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction, Hadley. Before I jump into speaking about Smokey and Hokia, I've been asked to speak a little bit about how we came up with the name for our exhibit. And as Hadley mentioned, um, during the planning of this exhibit, we were able to draw from both the collections at the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art here in Norman, as well as the collection at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City. And it was during a visit to the cowboy in the city that uh, we three curators came across a work that was by Stephen Mopope, and it was a poster for the Kiowa Agency. So that was um, kind of the jumping off point for the title of our exhibition, as well as the theme for the show. And if you are able to visit the show in person or to go through the kind of 3D walkthrough of the show online, you'll notice that right away we offer two different definitions of agency. And our first definition of agency is the capacity of individuals to act independently and make free choices. And, and an example of this definition is how members of the Kiowa Six chose to develop their artistic styles, even as they performed important services to their communities. And then we offer a second definition of agency, which is a bit more related to the MoPo poster. And this definition is of agency is a governmental department that is responsible for a particular activity. For example, the Anadarko Agency run by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which services the Kiowa tribe of Oklahoma and six other tribes. So hopefully that is a good starting point for tonight's talk. And now I will begin to talk about Lois Smokey. 
So Louise or Lois Smokey was born in 1907 to Enoch and Maggie Smokey in Anadarko, Oklahoma's Old Town. While her friends and family called her Lois, her Kiowa name was Bogota or Coming of the Dawn. Smokey has been until fairly recently the overlooked sixth member of a group previously called the Kiowa Five, which we now refer to as the Kiowa Six. In addition to being the great niece of a Kiowa chief, Smokey came from a family of artists. Her grandmother Mary and mother Maggie were renowned and are still remembered in Anadarko for their beadwork. The two matriarchs, along with Lois and her Smokey, were part of the Mao Tame Club, a women's domestics art group organized by Bureau of Indian Affairs field matron Susie Peters. Although Lois Smokey's time at the University of Oklahoma was short, the painted figural work that she chose to create while in Norman is both representative of her strong artistic lineage and revolutionary for the native female artists that followed her. Growing up in Anadarko, however, Smokey attended St. Patrick's Mission School from 1916 until 1922. Afterwards, she attended Verdon High School from 1924 to 1926. Despite the harsh standards imposed by St. Patrick's, some of Smokey's fondest memories were of the parochial school. For example, in a 1975 interview with the Anadarko Daily News, Smokey recognized Father Hitta of St. Patrick's as well as Peters, as two outsiders who first noticed the artistic talents of the young Kiowa Six. However, Smokey also emphasized her regret in the interview that scholars have overlooked the impact on artists of Sister Mary Olivia Taylor, a Choctaw teacher at St. Patrick's, and Sister Dio Gracias, who also worked at the school. In addition to the artistic encouragement from the two sisters and Peters, Willie Bays Lane, an artist from Chickasha, provided Kiowa students with formal Western style art lessons in Anadarko's Old City Hall on Sundays. You can see in this glamour shot of Smokey on the screen right now that she's written a dedication to Mrs. Lane, whom she calls, quote, my first teacher, end quote. And while Smokey continued her artistic studies at the University of Oklahoma, she claimed that she never considered painting professionally and saw attending OU as an opportunity to do, quote, something fun and interesting, end quote. But Smokey exhibited a great deal of bravery and agency when she came to campus and spent the fall of 1927 there creating artwork. After finishing one semester in Norman, however, she chose to return to Anadarko and James Ochai took her place on campus. It seems likely that changes in Kiowa culture, as well as common motives for women to attend college at the time, likely contributed to her short stay in Norman. For example, at the time, the Kiowa community in Anadarko was going through a number of changes, many of which were related to the adoption of new technologies. In addition, for many women who attended college in the 1920s, the experience was more typically about finding a well-educated man as a partner, rather than for preparing a career or honing a skill. These factors, in combination with Smokey's thoughts that attending OU would be, quote, something fun to do, end quote, and some a hostility towards her from her male colleagues for creating figural work likely led to her short stay on campus. And can I have a slide change, please? Thank you. While at the university, however, Smokey created roughly 50 figural paintings and is recognized as the first Native American woman in Oklahoma to step outside the accepted role of Native women and paint figures, which were subjects previously exclusive to Plains men. Up until that point, while Plains women might prepare the surfaces on which the scenes were created, male artists painted historical narratives, winter counts, calendars, and other figurative images. In contrast, when Plains women painted, they typically created non-figural or geometric images. Smokey, however, consciously broke with customary ideas concerning the role of Plains women artists by choosing to paint Native women, children, and men in traditional Kiowa attire. Painted flatly with no apparent backgrounds, Smokey's paintings from OU have paved the way for later Native women artists, including Jean Bales, Virginia Stroud, Sharon Otto and Harjo, and others, to achieve success in figural painting. In Smokey's compositions, including Indian Maiden, which is on the screen right now, women and children are positioned frontally and have doll-like qualities to their forms. Generally, these figures are bilaterally symmetrical with rosy cheeks, wide eyes, and they embody a sense of stillness. Indicative of her family history, we can see that Smokey pays special attention to the rendering of beadwork in her paintings. 
Similar to other members of the Kiowa Six, however, Smokey does abstract her forms to flat planes of color with little to no modeling. And can I have another slide change? Thank you. In her scenes of mothers and their children, including Kiowa family on the screen now, Smokey conveys the innocence of youth and the tender bond between parent and child. Children in her work are often engaging with their mother in some way, either by holding her hand, peeking out at the viewer from behind her legs, or mirroring her pose. As Oscar Jacobson, the director of OU School of Art at the time, wrote in an unpublished biography of Smokey, quote, all of her work has a great feminine delicacy and charm. They are also instinctively sentimental towards motherhood and childhood, end quote. While Jacobson attempts to describe Smokey's body of work positively here, he relies on some stereotypes concerning women by mentioning Smokey's innate instinct to mother, as well as her overall delicate and sentimental nature. Before her death in 1981, Smokey raised seven children with her second husband, Robert. Though she was busy being a mother on a working farm, Smokey never gave up creating artwork after her time at OU. Upon her return to Anadarko, she had turned from producing watercolor paintings to making beautifully crafted beadwork as her mother and grandmother had done before her. And by continuing her own artistic practice through beadwork and teaching her children how to paint, Smokey continued her artists, her family's artistic tradition, as, and asserted herself as a strong agent of cultural transmission within the Kiowa community. While Smokey is often excluded from discussions of the group of Kiowa artists, as the formerly prevalent, the Kiowa Five label to describe the, co the cohort emphasizes, the work that she completed at OU paved the way for future generations of female native painters. And then the next artist that I was in charge of researching and writing about is Jack Hokia. So if we could have another slide change. Thank you. And Jack Hokia was born in 1901 in Caddo County, Oklahoma. He held many roles during his life, such as student, boxer, father, artist, and dancer. While he was orphaned as a young boy, he was raised by his grandmother, and Hokia was, along with Spencer Asa and Stephen Mopope, from a distinguished line of artists. These artistic predecessors included his uncle Charles, who had been a prisoner in Fort Marion, Florida, and uncle Silverhorn, who was also a notable ledger artist. Hokia strongly asserts this family history, along with his own interests as a young man, in the paintings that he created before, during, and after his time at the University of Oklahoma. But before that, Hokia had also attended St. Patrick's Mission School in Anadarko, where he was educated through the eighth grade. At St. Patrick's, Sister Mary Olivia Taylor, who is shown on the right in this picture, allowed Hokia to draw various scenes, mostly of his choosing, on the school's blackboard. Taylor's support and Hokia's early demonstrations of artistic agency were later complemented by art lessons with the Euro-American artist, Willie Bays Lane. The Bureau of Indian Affairs field matron, Susie Peters, who's shown on the left in this image, worked closely with Kiowa peoples in Anadarko and arranged for St. Patrick's artistic students, including Hokia and Smokey, to participate, participate in these classes with Lane. These early artistic experiences in Anadarko helped prepare Hokia and Smokey for the more formal artistic training that they would undergo at the University of Oklahoma. And in the spring of 1927, Peters brought Hokia, Asa, Mopope, and Monroe Satok to OU to practice studio art under the supervision of Oscar Jacobson. Although Jacobson did not instruct the Kiowa artists directly, he wrote extensively about the group, which will later include Smokey and James Ochai. In an unpublished manuscript, Jacobson reflects a positive but somewhat stereotypical view of Hokia when he writes, quote, Jack is the fiercest looking warrior in his kindness and himself, and how he can dance, end quote. And can I have a slide change here? Thank you. Along with the other Kiowa Six artists, while at OU, Hokia chose to focus on subjects informed by his Southern Great Plains heritage. These subjects included Kiowa dances, which, as Jacobson writes, Hokia frequently took part in as a skilled dancer in other ceremonial occasions. Connoisseurs recognized Hokia's early painting style for its simplicity in detail, sharp lines, and bold colors. 
In Hokio's OU paintings, including Kaiowa Dancer, which is on the screen now, he creates a strong sense of depth by layering different compositional elements, such as various aspects of a dancer's regalia. Though abstracted, the forms that Hokia painted are rich in detail and bright jewel tone colors. In Jacobson's same unpublished manuscript, he notes that Hokia's paintings, quote, look like gems, end quote, a distinct characteristic that sets Hokia's work apart from the work of others in his cohort. While Hokia rendered specific scenes from Kiowa life, including dances, the figures that he portrayed were not necessarily portraits of specific individuals, but rather images that could represent many young Kiowa men or women. And another slight change, please. Thank you. In 1930, after several semesters spent at OU, Hokia, Asa, and Mopope chose to travel and work widely in New Mexico. Quickly after arriving in the state, Hokia spent almost a decade with the famous San Ildefonso painters, or potters, excuse me, Maria and Julian Martinez. During the 10 years that Hokia was in New Mexico, he was adopted by the Martinez family and completed various murals in Santa Fe. According to Ochai, the time that Hokia spent in New Mexico helped immensely in building a lasting friendship and artistic exchange between Plains and Pueblo peoples. Hokia, showing his locals his own artwork and regalia, exerted a considerable influence on the style of Pueblo paintings. The pure design and details of Pueblo and watercolors also inspired Hokia in return, and he ch chose to adapt Puebloan characteristics into his own artistic, artistic practice, as seen here in Sacred Flying Water Serpent from San Ildefonso Pueblo. In this painting, Hokia borrows several common Puebloan watercolor motifs, including the form of the Avanyu, or water serpent, and has rendered compositional elements in bright, bold colors. This interchange of stylistic ideas is notable because of the lack of artistic sovereignty experienced by Native artists at the, while at the Santa Fe Indian School and, to a degree, the University of Oklahoma. Euro-American instructors at the schools greatly encouraged artists to depict scenes and use styles, quote-unquote, traditional to their own cultures. And here, the kind of drips and blurring of colors you see are due to water damage to this particular painting which is somewhat ironic considering it contains an image of a water serpent. So eventually after extensive travel, Hokia chose to return to his home state where he spent the rest of his life. In Oklahoma, he lived with his wife, Daisy, their three biological children and several foster children. Before his death in 1969, Hokia created murals for the New York World's Fair. And though he continued to paint throughout his life, he also continued to dance and spent several year years touring with Tim Holt's Wild West show. Hokia acted as an agent of Kiowa cultural transmission in a variety of ways besides creating visual artwork. Today, he is remembered for the way he exerted his own agency through a distinct artistic style, a passion for dancing, and, a, and an acute attention to detail, all clearly reflected within his paintings. Thank you. Um, thank you, Olivia. It's my pleasure now to introduce Mariah Oschbacher, our second student curator. Mariah is pursuing her PhD in European art, specializing in late Neolithic and early Bronze Age Cycladic art. She serves an, as an adjunct professor of art history at the University of Oklahoma and at Oklahoma City Community College. Tonight, Mariah will be discussing the work of Stephen Mopope and Monroe Satoke. Thanks, Hadley. Um, these are my artists, Stephen Mopope and Monroe Satoke. Uh, Stephen Mopope, uh, featured there on the left, um, was born in 1898 on the Kiowa Reservation near Anadarko. He is um, the most prolific of the six artists um, with a career that spanned about 60 years. He began painting when he was 16 with his uncles, um, as uh, Olivia mentioned, the same uncles, I believe they're distant cousins, uh, Charlie Buffalo and um, Silverhorn. Charlie Buffalo was a um, Fort Marion prisoner and um, ledger artist there. And Silverhorn um, is a famous ledger artist. And so uh, Stephen Mopope was invited at 16 um, for what he considered the greatest honor of his 
career in his life, which was to help his uncles uh, recreate the famous Kiowa battle teepee. Um, the, you can go ahead and change to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, the image that I chose for Stephen Mopoke to discuss um, is one of his many images of buffalo hunt. This is an image that is held at the um, National Cowboy Western Heritage Museum. Uh, but the Fred Jones also has an image. This is um, such a great image and very different as you've seen from the other two artists so far, although Stephen did draw, as you may have seen um, in the exhibition, he did draw and paint uh, many dancers. Um, and he himself was um, a dancer in the powwow circuit, very um, famous, well-known championship dancer, uh, especially for um, uh, one dance in particular called the Eagle Dance. Um, but he always seemed to come back to these buffalo scenes, which I, the scenes of a buffalo hunt, which I find very kind of romantic, um, a romanticism held in them even in his adult years because he always said that when he was a little boy, he wanted to be a great Kiowa warrior. And I can imagine him having been born in 1898, his relatives have only been on the reservation for um, 20 years. That's really not that much time actually. And um, his family, the men in his family, they were great Kiowa warriors um, as well as artists. And um, I find it so romantic that, that he still held on to this little boy um, fascination of wanting to uh, follow the buffalo herd and live on the plains the way they did before the reservation. This scene is um, different than you see in other scenes, not only because it does not depict a dancer, um, it still has the flat imagery, um, the flat style, but he's painted some landscape elements, which I um, found really intriguing and quite unique among um, the over of the artists, uh, that he can show the depth of the planes through these landscape elements. And, um, you know, by layering the warrior and his horse against the buffalo, um, I always just found this <laughs> to be a great image. Um, go ahead and switch the next slide. Um, I picked these images as um, Olivia discussed about their time in uh, New Mexico. They, Jack Hokea, as she said, lived with the Martinez family. Um, Satoke and Mopo didn't live with them, but they often did. All the artists traveled to Gallup, New Mexico. It was uh, um, uh, a place of, of coming together and they would dance there. And that's probably where, where they met the Martinez family and um, developed relationship with them. And there's no evidence that this painting by Stephen Mopope represents uh, Maria, but um, I can't help but look at the image of her and compare it with archival photographs and look at um, her characteristic black pot and know that, that this must be an image of Maria Martinez. And that says so much about how um, much those relationships must have influenced uh, the Kiowa Six's artists. And um, similarly, you can see on the, the two images on the right-hand side, Satoke also painted um, a woman holding a black pot, and he's got almost two identical images there, one in a blue shawl, one in a white shawl. Um, and although you can't see her face, you can see the pot, uh, a, a sliver of the pot, rather. And, um, and I know that that, again, to me must must be Maria, although there's no firm evidence, but I love these images. It just speaks to their time in uh, New Mexico and how much of an influence that was as Plains artists that um, they did take in these other influences from other 
tribes and these connections and communications that they had. Go ahead and switch to the next slide. Uh, my last artist is Moro, uh, Monroe Satoki. Um, he is named after his father, uh, also named Satoki, which means hunting horse. And um, he had the shortest career, unfortunately. He died very young, um, only 32 or 33 years old. He had tuberculosis and died in 1937, only 10 years after the artists um, first came to OU. And um, he, in, in my opinion, is considered the most philosophical of the bunch. He was definitely the most spiritual. Susie Peters um, is said to have noticed that he um, didn't just try to capture the images, but he wanted the spirit, the Kiowa spirit, to be in his images. And if he wasn't feeling the, the spirit, then he would just abandon that painting. And it reminds me very much of many other non-Western art cultures that we see where um, art is really for them about, it's a spiritual experience. And, and if he wasn't feeling spirit working through him to translate that to the art, then, then he wouldn't finish it. It wasn't worthy. Um, and, and I appreciate that so much. He was very, very much involved um, also spiritually in the Native American church um, related to his tuberculosis. And um, he did a lot of paintings of Native American church. He, he didn't dance. I think that that was probably because of his tuberculosis, but he was a very accomplished singer and drummer um, on the powwow circuit with the dancers and other artists. and. Um, so, so he was participating in that capacity and successful, very successful at it. Um, this painting is the cover image for the Pochoir print por portfolio. This is called Love Call. And um, I chose this image, uh, number one, because um, it, it seems like a very sensitive image to me because he is more philosophical and spiritual. Um, but it's, it's also the story that goes behind it. Um, in my research, I found that not only the Kiowa, um, other tribes also have um, oral tradition about uh, a courting flute, if you will. I found it in Lakota. I found it in um, at least two woodland tribes, um, the Potawatomi and the Oneida and um, the Comanche. Um, for Southern Plains also had a story of a, of a courting flute or a love flute that, um, the, that would be carved by the male. And it had a special fetish near the mouthpiece, which is, um, it was carved into a little bird, which traditionally was, should have been a woodpecker. And it was facing away so that when he would um, blow his music into the flute, the bird, um, would, you know, spiritually go out and find his mate. And that's very much like um, what we see where birds carry the prayers to the creator. And um, I just love that story. And I love that he felt the spirituality to capture that um, here away from other things like a buffalo hunt or, or the dancing. Um, and even though it's still, you know, in the flat style, again, he's layered the, uh, the female behind the male to show that depth. And um, she's giving him a little bit of side eye there, which I, I love. She's looking at him. Obviously, he's played his flute and the spirit has brought his mate to him as, as the oral tradition goes. Um, and that's all I have. And I thank you. Thank you, Mariah. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce our third curator, Julia Hart. Julia is a recent graduate of the Accelerated Bachelors of Art and Masters of Art program in International Studies at the University of Oklahoma. She also holds a BA in Art History from OU and served as a Mellon Foundation curatorial intern at the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art in spring, this, this past spring. Um, tonight, Julia will be discussing Spencer Asa and James Ochai. 
Thank you, Hadley. Um, so I'll begin with Spencer Asa. The birth date listed here is um, circa 1906, um, and Spencer Asa died in 1954. Um, the reason for the confusion about the birth date is there are some um, discrepancies in the um, data that I found, but his wife, Ida Atokni Asa, um, seems to remember it in her interviews as 1906, so that's what we have listed here. Um, Spencer Asa was also known as Lalo, or Little Boy, and he was an accomplished Kiowa singer, dancer, silver worker, baseball player, and painter born near Carnegie, Oklahoma. Um, his father, James, was a well-known Buffalo medicine man. Um, the image that I've selected here um, is sort of um, a typical depiction of him wearing his father's um, buffalo horns. Um, you'll see that a lot in the photographs of Spencer Asa. Um, but if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, we can see the type of painting that um, would be most um, typical of Spencer Asa as well. Um, he contributed to the um, many mural projects that the Kiowa artists were involved in, um, but this smaller scale flat style um, work is, is most typical of what we would see of Asa, particularly in its depiction of dance. Um, Spencer Asa was a very skilled dancer and he accurately captured the detail, color and movement of dances in his paintings because of his firsthand um, expertise. Um, he danced regularly at powwows, um, including multiple visits to the Gallup intertribal ceremony. And um, something that was noted by his wife um, Ida was that he could repair nearly any part of the regalia. So that's bustles or warrant bonnets or um, the silver work as well, because he was so, so skilled at crafting it, he could repair it. Um, and I would imagine be a useful person to have um, before you're about to dance uh, if something went wrong. So um, one of the sources that we read in our research was um, Crafting an Indigenous Nation by Kiowa historian Jenny Tong Paho. And um, I want to bring up her work in this context because um, one of the things that she notes about the representation of um, dance or of visual expression, creative expression, sorry, in the changing landscape of early 20th century Oklahoma is that performances and the associated images of dancers represented a form of survivance. It connected the historical role of the Kiowa man as warrior while simultaneously negotiating new forms of representation. Um, and so one of the things that we talked about a lot and it's a thematic theme, or it's not a thematic theme, <laughs> it's a link throughout the um, exhibition, I think is the idea of cultural transmission. So these artists are connected with the past, but also um, representing themselves in new ways. And um, Asa's depiction of dance, um, both in terms of his um, painting, but also in his participation in the dance is one of those forms of representation and um, cultural transmission. So um, as another example of that, he actually also worked as a teacher at the Fort Sill and Riverside schools. Um, he taught young artists how to paint and how to dance at the same time. In a news article from the time period, he explained that students need to know the dances to get the positions right for their figures and to get the clothes right. But he also firmly believed in their artistic freedom saying, I help them with the color and the figures, but I want them to do it in their own way. In this sense, Asa epitomizes both the transmission of Kiowa culture, but also the assertion of Kiowa agency. Um, and again, that's the thematic um, link in this exhibition is Kiowa agency. And we see that in Asa's work as he helps to um, connect future generations with the past, but also allow them to do it in their own way. If we can go to the next slide, um, I included the images of two smaller ASA works. These are um, miniature, and I didn't see anything like this in the rest of our um, research. And I wanted to include it because it was just a sort of um, special and unique, um, special and unique works. These are, um, Again, colorful dance scenes, um, the detail in them, um, it may not look as detailed as the larger work, but um, it's just because of the small scale and um, 
I thought I would share something that was one of my favorite works from the exhibition as well. If you have a chance in either the gallery space um, or on the virtual exhibition, I highly encourage you to check them out. And then um, I would love to go to the next slide as well, please. Thank you. So the next artist that I'm going to speak about is James Ochai. Um, firmly born in 1906, we do have the documents for that. Um, he lived for longer than space, Spencer Asa, lived until 1974. He had a very prolific career as well, um, although he sort of dabbled in a lot of different things. So um, Ochai is known for his involvement in the Native American church. Um, he's known for his involvement in the Order of the Black Leggings Society. He worked as a curator um, at Fort Sill. And um, he also successfully petitioned government and officials in Texas um, to ha have the returns of his paternal grandfather um, to Satanta moved from a prison in Texas to Oklahoma for reburial. Um, and so he's well known for that um, accomplishment um, and for those other um, involvements in both uh, the Kiowa community and um, the larger Oklahoma and Texas communities. Um, however, I got to know Ochai um, on a, a more personal level as well through my research. Um, I had the pleasure of listening to his many, many hours of um, taped interviews with Arthur Silverman. Um, you may notice throughout the slideshow that a lot of the image credits and works are from the Silverman collection um, from the Cowboy Museum. And um, that's because Arthur Silverman collected a lot of these works. He was um, extremely interested in the artist, but he also had the chance to sit down um, with many of the artists at the time, including Ochai, and they, over the course of several years, um, sp spoke about Ochai's childhood, about his artistic practice, um, and about his, uh, you know, personal and professional life. So, um, a lot of my research and my essays and my um, interpretation of Ochai's work was through the lens of these personal experiences. Um, so I'd like to share a little bit of that with you today as we um, look through his works. First, um, I'll discuss the, the photograph that um, I chose. This is a younger photograph of Ochai um, during his time in the, in the Navy. It's actually depicted at Fort Marion in Florida. So um, as Mariah mentioned, um, during the 1870s, um, there were native prisoners that were transported to um, Fort Marion in Florida, including some of the um, relatives of the Kiowa artists. So um, James Ochai's maternal grand, um, grandmother's father um, was one of the prisoners at Fort Marion. But during Ochai's time in the Navy, he was uh, stationed in Florida and had the opportunity um, to identify and um, help to sort of interpret the etchings made by Native prisoners there. Um, and so I think that this is a really unique photograph. Um, you haven't seen him um, in photographs from later stages in his life. This is a younger photograph. He's depicted in his um, Navy uniform rather than um, sort of any other clothing, which is just a, um, a unique time period in his life and um, that he's in this moment that sort of represents, um, again, that cultural transmission where he's connecting the past um, and he's doing it in his own, um, in, in his own way. Um, thank you, yes, we can go to the, the next slide. Uh, one of the, the central stories in Ochai's um, interviews is how he received part of his um, talent from his maternal grandmother, Calco. Um, and he describes these early childhood ex experiences where he remembers, um, er he has these early memories of her medicine bag and her medicine balls. And she was a really respected color mixer. And so um, you can see that he, attri uh, he um, attributes some of his talent to her. Um, and also um, that she was a very powerful woman in the peyote religion. And so there's these family connections to painting in his family as well. Um, the slide that we see 
here titled Beadwork Designs 1921, um, I think is central in the narrative that we're trying to tell in this exhibition because it really evidences the artist's early work. 1921 is before their um, time period at OU. And Ochai insists in his interviews that um, he was selling artwork before they ever heard of Jake Gibson, before they ever heard of Susie Pierce. He had an artistic career and he was selling paintings. Um, and so I think that that really is central to that um, thesis of ours of, of agency and of the artist's agency. Um, but it's also a really cool work in itself. So um, you'll see that it sort of looks like abstract designs, but these are beadwork designs. So um, Ochai worked with the um, Women's Beadworking Club and he documented designs, created some of his own, the sort of dialogue about this is a little confusing about whether or not he was um, just make, um, just copying or he was sort of, um, taking some of their styles and adding something of his own, but he was recording beadwork designs and he used this sheet as his reference sheet so that when he was painting his own scenes, he would get the beadwork designs correct, essentially. And he used this as a, um, a reference sheet for decades. Um, you'll see, um, there's an interesting note, if you look um, at the bottom, it's written valuable history data. So um, I'm thinking that this is in Silverman's handwriting rather than Ochai's. Um, although the, the top part, the 1921 and Ochai's signature are his own. Um, but I think it was, it was important to include this work, even though it wouldn't necessarily traditionally be considered, you know, a finished piece of artwork. Um, it is important historical context um, to the work that the, um, that Ochai later painted, um, and it and it represents his relationship with his um, elders, and um, his role in recording and preserving Kiowa visual culture. Um, he talks about in his interviews that people would ask him just to paint things that they wanted to keep. So that could be shield designs, it could be visions, and that was part of his role as being um, an agent of change but also um a way of transmitting a, a function to transmit um kiowa visual culture um and we can go to the next slide as well please thank you so this um peyote enclosure study um is from decades later 1973 but um, i also wanted to share it with you all because it does um also represent sort of a, a unique work something that maybe we wouldn't necessarily um traditionally included are known in terms of the work of the Kiowa artists. Um, as you may know, it's um, pencil on paper, it's tracing paper. This is a sketch for a design. Um, this was something that we sort of uh, picked out as a really, um, something we wanted to focus on in the exhibition. Um, this idea of the tracing paper, the sketches, um, something that hasn't been noted or seen before um, that we saw in terms of the research or discussion of the Kiowa artists. Um, Ochai identifies that this was something that they learned during their time period at, at OU. Um, in the art classes that they attended, um, the other art students were using this. And then also Jacobson actually required the artist to complete sketches on tracing paper for his review before they could um, move on to painting. So he would make adjustments or comments. They would um, then transfer the design to paper that they could paint on. And if the first version of the painting sold, they had um, essentially a rough draft that they could use to make another version of the painting um, with obviously the goal being to choose successful paintings so that they could um, sell them. But the technique stuck. So um, the Cairo artists were at OU in the 1920s. This is in 1973. Um, Ochai was using it way later in his career and um, after his style has changed. So in this scene, you can see this is a um, highly geometric design. He's um, uh, drawing and painting, as you can see, the um, peyote enclosure. Actually, we could go to the um, next slide as well. Um, and you'll see the painted version of this work. So these are hung next to each other in the gallery space. You can see that if you explore it in person or in the digital exhibition, you can see the details that come out, but it's really unique. Um, and if you wouldn't mind going to the following slide, please. 
we can see them together. It's unique to see these two um, works next to each other. And um, in terms of the tracing paper technique, that was something that um, we noted as a really um, interesting way of thinking about transmission, right? Um, and it is representative of that cultural transmission that happens. So um, in the education space, in the gallery, um, there's the option to take home tracing paper packets to learn more about this technique and um, in sort of a metaphorical way, it also functions as um, this continuing cultural transmission. So um, if you have a chance, we'd love for you to stop by the gallery to see that. Um, and I think that's, that's all for me. So, um, I'm happy to turn it back over to Hadley for questions. Um, thank you, Julia, and I'll welcome all of the student curators back. Thank you all of you for your presentations. We'll take some time now to go over your questions and comments. So if you haven't already, you're welcome to type a question into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And we have a couple of questions in the queue. Um, I, I'll go ahead and ask the curators. Well, first of all, Mary Meredith, thank you, pointed out we should take a look at Narcissa Chisholm Owen, who's a Cherokee artist. Um, thank you for sharing that, Mary. And Another question, this is really a question I think for Julia. Trump, Travis Mamaday asks, how can the general public go about listening to those interviews? And Julia, would you like to field it since you spent so much time with, with sure. that? Sure. Um, so my understanding is you can make an appointment with the cowboy if you want to listen to it, although um, it is like in an actual cassette tape <laughs> format. So that's, um, it could be a little bit tedious. There is a transcript of selected portions of the um, interviews available online and then um the librarians they were actually kind enough to help with the process of digitizing the tapes so not all of them have been digitized but um, a number of them have as a result of the research for the exhibition um, and my understanding is that um fred jones is going to make a, um, some of those available um online on the site um in conjunction with the exhibition um but if you're interested in more i'd be happy to talk more about it and then also getting in touch with um the people who work at the Dickinson Research Center at the Cowboy who have access to all of those materials. Yeah, actually, I, I can add to that. So there's a QR code that you can scan. If you're actually in the exhibit, you can scan it and it will take you to um, a private site, a private YouTube site um, through the museum's website where you can listen to some of the recordings that, um, that Julia was listening to. But then if you want access to all of them, you would you would need to go to the Cowboy Hall of Fame. But if you have questions about accessing those materials, at least through, through the exhibit and through our site, um, I encourage you to send an email either to me or to you can, you can email our museum info um, email address and we'll get that information to you. It's just museuminfo at ou.edu. Um, here's a question from Tracy. What are the mediums used on most of the paintings seen tonight? I can answer that one. So a lot of the works that are in the show and that you saw tonight are created with watercolors. So they're watercolor on paper. Julia showed some kind of preparatory drawings that are, I would say, graphite or charcoal on tracing paper. And a lot of their work is also created using tempera on paper. And Mariah mentioned uh, the pouchoir printing process. So if you go to the show or if you check out the 3D digital version of it online, you can see we have an area where we discuss this pouchoir printing process, which was a really specialized um, art form that was produced in France. So to sum up, um, you saw watercolor, you saw tempera, you saw drawings, and you might have seen some pouchoir prints. Okay, great. Um, let me see. Um, Ashley Holland, a, a fellow OU grad, asks, in the creation of this show, were you all able to reach out to any Kiowa community members or members of the Kiowa Six family for your research? Yeah, we um, dealt with Warren Wheaton from our uh, tribal liaison. 
on campus, and he helped us out quite a bit. Um, I think, I know, personally, I um, made an attempt to reach out to um, some of Mopope's relatives. COVID makes it hard, and <laughs> that really put a damper on everything, um, at least for us. I don't know if Olivia and Julia want to say about their artists and their research. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, I would I would note that a lot of the texts that we were signed during the course were written by indigenous artists, so or sorry, authors. So Julia mentioned Jenny Tonepahot, um, who unfortunately recently passed away, but she was Kiowa and we read a book about Kiowa cultural expression written by her. And we read another text by Gunlaug Fur, who is a Swedish author, but she relied heavily on interviews with members of Stephen Mopope's family. And we prioritize using um, interviews with the artists themselves, which Julia can talk a bit more about uh, those tapes that everyone's so interested in. Um, yeah, so uh, echoing that in terms of um, referring to the artist's voice um, as best we could in our in our own research. So um, this the same thing that um, my co-curators have said in terms of um, being a little bit frustrated about the restraints of a semester long course, <laughs> a pandemic, <laughs> um, but also recognizing that it was important in the research to be um, as cognizant of the, the artist's voice as possible. And so referring back to those primary documents um, rather than looking at it through lenses of other interpretations. I think we were really blessed that um, that we had so much archival primary material from the artists themselves, thanks to um, Silverman. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm just noticing now, um, Summer wrote in her cute question, thank you for this presentation. I enjoyed it. I'm the eldest great granddaughter of Stephen Mopo. He raised my mother, Vanessa. Jennings. Um, thank you for joining us, Summer, and I know you're not the only uh, relative of one of the artists who's joining us today. And I, I'm just going to take a moment and speak on behalf of the museum. We're actually trying to um, make um, reach out to family members and descendants of the artists for a, um, a private viewing in January that would be just for family members, descendants, um, and Kiowa elders who want to come to the museum when it's closed to the public, so on a, a safer um, environment. And we would love to host you and your families. And we're trying very hard to get contact information for as many um, people who would like to come as possible. So if, if you are um, related to or, or know a relative of one of these artists, please, please um, let them know to reach out to us. You can email us again at the museum info at ou.edu, or you can look me up on the museum's website and my email address and my phone number are listed. Um, and we really want to make this exhibit and, and not just the work that's in the exhibit, but work that's in the permanent collection that's not even on view right now, available to any of you who would like to see it in as safe, safe a way as possible. And that would be on a Monday in January when the museum is closed to the public. So I hope, I hope you'll reach out, to, reach out to us and thank you so much, um, Summer, for, for joining us tonight. I, I will say that, um, that Vanessa Jennings has done so much um, I was I was able to look at archival interviews from um, with her at the Cowboy. Um, she's done so much to talk about her grandfather's legacy, to talk about um, being raised by her grandparents and and those experiences. Um, I was really blessed to have those videos and those interviews with her that that I could access, and that was really. Um, and particularly great, especially um, some some uh, interviews that she did at Brown University when they discovered that they had a set of Stephen Mopo prints, um, and and it it really helped that way. Um. I'm just going to, I'm, I'm kind of randomly selecting questions. Thank you all for your questions. Um, Michelle has asked, can the curators talk more about their selection process for the exhibition and how they work together on that aspect? Uh, 
Um, I can start if you want. Uh, so part of this was done um, in the format of the course where we toured both museums. Um, the curators of um, both museums were um, kind enough to prepare the works that they had in the collections. Um, and so that we were able to view all of the works that, that both the Cowboy and Fred Jones had in their collections. Um, and then the structure of it was sort of broken up the way that we gave the talk in terms of dividing and um, with the artists. So um, we each uh, selected two artists and then um, the sections of the exhibition were, were mainly curated um, according to that so that um, we each chose a, um, a certain number of works um, by each artist. I don't know if anyone else wants to add, add more to that. Yeah, I can jump in. So there were some limitations, um, even though both the Cowboy and the Fred have really amazing collections and a lot of Kiowa 6 artwork. Lois Smokey, for example, if you go to the show or see it online, as I keep mentioning, um, you notice that she has fewer artworks than the other artists. And that was because between the Fred and the Cowboy, there were only six works by Smokey um, total. So that wasn't, you know, a purposeful admission. That was just due to limitations. But otherwise than that, I think we all tried to show the breadth of the artist's careers as well. We didn't want to just focus on showing the work that they created on o at OU. We also wanted to show artwork from, you know, much later in their lives to demonstrate how they kept changing and growing as artists. And equal representation was important. Yes. As much as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, great. Here's a question. This is from Claire Young, who is actually one of our Mellon Foundation interns this fall, and she's, she's interning for us from a distance. She's at Dartmouth. Um, so thank you for joining us tonight, Claire. I know it's really late for you. Um, she is wondering if any of you have plans to continue with this work or research or to continue researching a particular artist of the Kiowa Six. And also, um, a kind of second question is that as much as she loves hearing Oscar Jacobson quotes, how all, how did you all navigate centering native voices in this research? Um, she commented that she really liked hearing about those, those tapes, Julia. Well, that was part of the, the um, agency part of our theme was to give the artists their own voice. Um, if you live here in Oklahoma, if you're associated with OU, and you've heard about the Kiowa Six before, um, everything that we had found previously exhibited was centered around Oscar Jacobson. And we really wanted to um, move away from that and, and make this about the artists and not, not um, the, the discovery story um, so much. And so that was important to us. Yeah, and to answer kind of the first part of Claire's research, um, in my in my own research, which most of it has been done in the archives of the Oklahoma Historical Society, I've come across a lot of the women who are involved with the Kiowa Six's time at OU. So we mentioned Sister Olivia Taylor and Susie Peters and Lily Bays Lane, but there were also other women who were involved, like Jean Dussel, who was Oscar Jacobson's wife. He gets a lot of the attention and scholarship, even though she was interacting with these artists as well and also writing about them pretty prolifically. And while they were at OU, they weren't directly oversaw, they weren't under the direct influence of Oscar Jacobson. Rather, they were working with uh, a female artist named Edith Mahie. So we really tried to, like Mariah said, avoid this discovery narrative and one, focus on the artist's voices themselves and two, just kind of bring in Jacobson when it was necessary to do so. Yeah, I think that's one of the refreshing um, aspects of the exhibition. Um, it did occur to me, We've sorry, we've mentioned a lot about the um, archives that we've visited and um, the OU's own Western history collection has amazing, amazing material. And um, I know that I was able to get a lot of data from, from their archives. And so I did just want to mention, shout out for the Western history collection. <laughs> um. Um, okay, so actually that kind of, there's another question that kind of relates to this topic. Um, someone had asked, and now I'm, I'm, I've lost track of it, about 
scholars who, oh, here it is. Paula Keltner asks, is there a serious body of critical work on these artists? And if so, who are the principal scholars we could find? I think you're, you're looking at some of them, Paula. <laughs> um, I'll just answer on behalf of the museum that the catalog that is, that is, has been published in, a, in connection with this exhibition has two essays by um, Dan Swan, who was, um, who's the, he's retired now, but he was the curator at the Sam Noble Museum and really a, a specialist on peyote uh, the peyote religion and images related to the Native American church. And then also in Eric Singleton, who's a curator up at the uh, National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum. Um, but I'll, I'll let the group talk about um, about Jenny Tonpahot and other resources that they found. Well, it was really kind of um, uh, piecemeal. There's not and that's, that's what made this exhibition so important is that there's not just, you know, um, a scholar we could go to when we really were digging through archives and um, piecing puzzles together because um, this catalog and this exhibition is, um, to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the kind of first comprehensive, I don't know that we're comprehensive, but, um, scholarly studies on, on the artists in this way. Um, yeah. Um. Yeah, I can really quickly just jump in. Uh, like, I, like I mentioned, I think in one of my previous responses, we read Dr. Tompa Hote's book, which is called Crafting an Indigenous Nation, Kiowa Expressive Culture in the Progressive Era. And while that does have um, a pretty hefty section on some of the Kiowa Six artists that, you know, looks at Kiowa culture, cultural expression as a whole, so it's not specifically dedicated to them. And the other text I mentioned, Gunlog Furs, um, I think it's Painting Nature, Painting Culture, that's her book, that is more focused on Stephen Mopope's interaction with uh, Oscar Jacobson. So those are two resources, but like Mariah said, it was pretty piecemeal, but I think we all enjoy archival work. So that was kind of the fun part of it. Yeah. You, you can't be any kind of a historian without really being excited to um, solve a mystery in, <laughs> in archives. Um, here's a question. Um, Chelsea Herr, another uh, fellow OU graduate asks, can you speak more to the idea of cultural transmission when the original viewers of these works were largely non-Kiowa people? Um, I, can, I can pick up on that a little bit. Thank you, Chelsea, for your question. I think it's a really um, important one. Um, I sort of came at this when I'm speaking about cultural transmission and thinking about um, particularly Ochai and Asa. Um, one of the things that really um, stood out to me about the, the two of them was their role as educators. Um, and so maybe not cultural transmission and just the sense of the paintings, which um, as you noticed were originally for um, more Western viewers, but um, education, ed cultural transmission in the sense of education. So they worked as art teachers, they worked as curators, um, and in and that, and that was in the Kiowa community. And so um, teaching the dance, teaching the styles of painting, that that action was a part of the cultural transmission as well. Um, and I think that was one of the things that we really wanted to emphasize, ab emphasize about the artists was that um, they were more than just painters. They were um, artists in a really holistic sense and um, agents of cultural transmission in a really holistic sense. Absolutely. I think a few of us also mentioned how widely some of the artists traveled, right? A few of them went to New York and like I mentioned, Hokia participated in the New York's World's Fair painting murals. And um, the three artists who went to New Mexico, that's a really great example of cultural transmission and exchange where they were showing Pueblo peoples their regalia and their art, and they were being shown the Puebloan regalia and art in return. And as the works that Mariah showed and also the last Hokia piece I brought up, um, this transmission stuck. Uh, so either they adopted some of the Puebloan watercolor techniques like we saw with Hokia, or they were painting uh, Pueblo people wearing traditional Pueblo clothing. It's really, in my opinion, that's one of um, like the most visual 
expressions of cultural transmission that we have, at least in the show. So I, I think what, what I think we're talking about, but the word we're missing is, um, it was like intertribal um, cultural transmission um, in that way. Um, I know that Stephen Milpope um, traveled quite a bit to um, collect dances and um, Monroe Satoke collected songs of, of different tribes, but still that's like intertribal plus Gallup where it was this kind of um, place of contact for, for tribes to come together. Um, yeah, I think, I think when we talk about cultural transmission, I think it's important to say we're talking about intertribal. Um, well, this is kind of a related question if you're if your um, expander definition of transmission, but um, can you tell us anything more about Ochai's interpretations of the etchings at the fort in Florida? Um, Julia, were you able to find out anything more about that, about his his work on I that? I um, read some about it. If I remember correctly, um, he did speak about it being um, inter-calendar related. And so there was, um, it was a marking of time. Um, but I would have to review the recordings a little bit more. I can't say that off the top of my head, I had all of it, um, that I remember all the details. Um, but that that was um, an important, I thought, connection to not only his family, but also, um, as you mentioned, the other um, artists' family who, who were in prison there. And that he was, you know, in this really unique moment where he's serving in the United States military but he's also connected um, with a part of history where that military functioned, you know, in, a, in an oppressive way against his, his relatives. So um, it, just that, that photograph to me is sort of emblematic of that um, sort of, I don't even know how to describe it in terms of <laughs> um, just like a really complex situation. I think that that's what, what these artists in general were navigating as a really complex cultural dynamic um, cultural moment, so. Uh, I thought that was really kind of a fascinating aspect of, of your research too. And I would have, I would really like to know more about his, you know, what his findings there and what, and his experience there for sure. Um, I'm, I'm probably mispronouncing your name, Kinda Aguilar, I'm, I'm so sorry, but um, so they would love to come and our relative by marriage to Hokia. That's great, and, and I hope you'll reach out to us. Um, we'd, be, we'd be thrilled to have you visit the museum and see the exhibit and join, join us in January. Um, someone else has asked, are your intentions to remain in Native art if you didn't have a lot of interaction uh, with Kiowa people in this exhibition? And I think part of that had a lot to do with this, the way the semester felt um, basically kind of unraveled with COVID. We, um, the students, were did meet with Warren um, Ketone, who was the Kiowa liaison for the university and the tribe. But I, I would I would ask that question: Are you all interested in in continuing your studies in Native art um, and, and where it might take you? Yeah, I can jump in and answer that. So it was absolutely our intentions to meet with Kiowa individuals in the community. And for a variety of reasons, um, COVID being a large one, we weren't able to do so. Another factor in this was the fact that if we wanted to interview living people, we would have to go through the institutional review board process. And unfortunately, we were informed about that um, a bit too late in the semester. We wouldn't have been able to speak to anyone or interview anyone. Um, until basically the spring semester was over. So we weren't able to do that. And it's really, it's really unfortunate. And as Haley mentioned at the beginning of this talk, I am focusing in modern and contemporary Native American artwork. And I would like to say that I make prioritizing Native voices and scholarship my you know, utmost priority. I'm working on my thesis right now about contemporary Native artists in the Twin Cities area specifically Andrea Carlson. And because I have the time to do so, I was able to go through the IRB process and I've interviewed Carlson as well as other Twin City Native artists several times. And it's a wonderful, wonderful process. And I think we all regret that we weren't able to explore that avenue as much as we would like to with this exhibit. And we see 
and here are your concerns and uh, just know that that's not how we wanted it to turn out. Yeah. Um, here's another question. Any surprises revealed in your research? I think I've talked about this a lot, but Hokia's sacred flying water serpent, that was kind of wild to come across just because it's so different in style than um, his other work and kind of just the other Kiowa works in general. And also learning that it is water damage and it's showing a water serpent, that was um, unfortunate, but also kind of funnily ironic. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that, that piece is so, I think, wonderful just as an example of, of the interaction between these cultures and the, the sharing of, of um, symbolism and style like you, you saw, Olivia. And, and it's, it's a real shame that it's, that it's in the shape it's in and is to, to the degree that we, it's not conservable. Um, so when you go to the museum, what you will see on view is actually a reproduction for those of you that see it, because it's actually too fragile to even, um, to even put the hinges on so that it could be installed on the wall. Um, um, Robert Bailey asks, is, is the catalog available? Yes, it is. And you can get it at the museum. In fact, I'll just <laughs> show you right now. It's very nice, um, substantial catalog, and it is um, available free of charge thanks to the Mellon Foundation. So um, yeah, you can you can find it in the gallery. Um, here's an, here's another question: Where did the flat style of painting come from? Is there any reason why these paintings lack backgrounds? I think it um, comes from. Uh, the what they learned previous with ledger art and TP painting, um, uh, painting your your accomplishments, uh, you know, on on your TPs. They're they're uh, if you um, look at the post office murals, um, one of the scenes that the group painted shows them setting up their Kiowa camp, and all of the TPs are um, painted especially. Uh, for, you know, in reference to each family. And so it would be that, that uh, warrior's accomplishment, you know, in, in great battle, great hunt, etc. So I think that that's probably um, where it started. Um, but I, I will pick up a little bit in terms of the um, flat style and talking a little bit about um, what was considered to be um, or sort of enforced as um, authentic art in terms of um, what Jacobson was um, asking the artists to paint. So um, that's something we saw in terms of their, their time at OU and what was expected and what was typical. Um, and so there, there are definitely connections to the past, um, but there were also um, expectations in, in terms of maintaining um, a particular style um, that he saw as again, authentic in quotes, um, authentically Kiowa or Native. Um, and I just wanna take a moment to, um, to address the concern of, I think, one or several attendees who've, who've noted, noted that we've, we've named uh, relatives dur during the Kiowa mourning period. And I'm so sorry that that has happened. And it was certainly, I don't think anyone's intention here to disrespect Kiowa beliefs. Um, so please accept our apologies for that. And thank you for sharing. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, here's a question. In some of the early images, no hands were drawn or they were covered by a shawl or some other material. Is this common? Is it stylistic? Um, there are quite a few works that have hands in them. Um, speaking as a visual artist, I know that hands are like the bane of everyone's existence. So I think sometimes it's easier to cover them, but I don't, they, they were certainly capable of painting hands. And if you go to the exhibit, you can see um, 
Smokey has quite a few hands out displayed. And I think in some representations, just the sleeves or like the questioner asked, the, the shawls just happen to be covering them. Um, okay. Um, I can I think that Julia could answer this very quickly. Does the last Ochai image in color refer to the peyote ceremony? Um, yes, yes, it does. Um, he was um, a very involved member of the Native American church. A lot of his works refer to um, peyoteism, and that one particularly um, is, is sort of set in a peyote lodge. Um, and there's a lot of symbolism in there that we probably don't have time to get into, and um, I wouldn't want to speak to necessarily, but um, if you compare those two works, you can see it um, in greater detail. Um, and, and I think there's more information about that in the in the catalog as well, if you're interested. In the catalog, and you might also um, look into Dan Swan's work on, on the Native American church and, and imagery associated with the Native American church. It's, I think we could recommend that, that resource. Um, and then finally, I'm going to kind of combine some of these questions into one since we're running out of time. Can you talk about your curatorial process for creating the show? I think some of that has already been covered. What were the highs and lows, things you will take with you into your future careers? Well, um, part of the, the course is really that it was a, it was a class. And so it was um, structured from, from the start and we are um, students as, as a part of it. So um, I think there's a little bit, um, it would look a little different if you're if you're doing this professionally. You have a little bit probably more flexibility, time, um, and but I think part of the advantage of doing that is that you have all of this um, great advice, great um, I mean te team players sort of built in. So um, I really appreciated having co curators. Um, I know that's something that um, in terms of professional work, I would, I would see as being an advantage in the future as well um, is, as working in a curatorial team. I think um, bouncing ideas off of each other, you, you get the best parts. Um, and um, I, I would say that that's a strength um, in terms of any um, curatorial process, so. Absolutely, and I think I uh, could probably speak for everyone in attendance by saying that COVID definitely was one of the, the lows of this process. Um, but the flip side of that was that we all got super comfortable with using Zoom. So we were able to have a lot of productive meetings through Zoom. And some of the fun parts of the exhibition planning process, like actually deciding the gallery layout and the colors, um, that kind of resulted in Julia, Mariah, and I like sharing someone's screen and then like very tediously moving like blocks around because none of us knew how to like use exhibition software. So definitely a learning curve. Um, but I think we are like ready for most scenarios now since we planned during a pandemic. I'm not really sure what would come next. Knock on wood. It did, it did make it hard. We were locked down since what, March, March 13th, and it wasn't even as, as, you know, free as it is now. Um, we were, you know, we're literally planning in our lockdown in our homes. So it, it really did make, make it difficult um, in that aspect. But thank goodness we had already um, done a lot of our research in the archives and things like that um, to get, you know, the artist voices primarily. Yeah, I would second that. And from the museum's perspective too, because originally this would have been a summer show mm -hmm. and it was postponed until the fall because the museum wasn't even open until August because of, of COVID. So it was really, a, it was a difficult year. And I think I would congratulate all of you for, for um, really rising above the the challenges that this year faced, and in really a short amount of time. I mean, that the the time frame is is difficult, right? It's it's not ideal, but made even more complex when you have a pandemic and the museums that you need to visit and the people you yeah. need to see are not available. Yeah. And well, and I think that Brad and Carrie um, on the prep team deserve so much credit for everything that they did to help us in the beginning with, while we're all working from our homes on Zoom and they can't get to the museum and tell us what they have or what's available, um, 
you know, no access to the software, the computers at the museum. It was really, you know, it was it was kind of a hairy situation there for a while, and I'm glad that that everything came together. So great. Yeah, I would encourage any of you who don't feel comfortable coming to the museum um, during COVID, although it's, you know, it's probably a good time to visit art museums where there's not a lot of, you know, you, there's nothing to touch. Um, um, to please take a look at the virtual gallery. We just we just made this available um, this past week, and it's and it's a, a new way that the museum is trying to reach out to audiences that might not be able to come in person. And you can you can literally or metaphorically, I guess, uh, walk through the space and zoom in and see these these works up close, um, and also the the text surrounding them. And I think just as a kind of last question, um, I'm just combining these two, has centering the exhibition around the individuals themselves added to the scholarship on the Kiowa Six? And I guess as a kind of uh, tie-in question, can you comment on why this was the topic or subject of the course and exhibition? I, I think that latter question is really not a question for, for the students, but rather um, the our previous museum director and and their um, instructor, Dr. Jackson Rushing, who together saw that there's really a need for um, for serious work on the Kiowa Six, and there there really hadn't been an exhibition that was dedicated to these six artists and really treated them equally, but also, as the students discovered, kind of avoided falling into the Jacobson track, Jacob Jacobson track trap, <laughs> I'm not gonna get that right, the Jacobson trap. Um, and I, and I, so I think that the two of them really kind of, um, Jack Rushing and, and um, Mark White saw the, saw the real need for an, an exhibition and a course on this topic. And especially with two really wonderful collections of work by these artists right here locally between the Cowboys collection and our collection. Um, but I, I'll let you all elaborate on that if you know. <laughs> I think towards the first part of that question um, about why we decided to make the focus on the artists like this um, individually, you know, it, it goes along with our theme, Kiowa Agency, because I know that in, in my research, and I'm sure in the others, that, um, that they faced, it wasn't as easy as just painting these pictures that they wanted to paint or coming to OU. Um, they they faced you know hardships and and um, reprisals and and um, you know for representing things that maybe um, the government felt like they weren't supposed to represent as far as uh, the physical Kiowa agency went or um, you know I know that I. Uh, read in my research that they would take their paintings back to the elders and say, is this okay? Um, you know, uh, it was it was not as easy as just painting a painting the way we think that artists work today. Um, it was it was a sacrifice for them to to do their art. And one thing that I particularly loved was a letter um, that Stephen Mopope wrote to his mother that talked about how um, it didn't matter what he had to face because painting for him was like breathing. He had to do, he had to do this. Just to follow up on the, the question, why the Kiowa art, right? Um, there's a lot of scholarship on Pueblo watercolor painting. That's kind of an area of Southwest Native art history that's been ex examined pretty extensively. And what's kind of left out is that there was something very similar happening here in Oklahoma at the university. So I think one of the, the aims of this course and this exhibit is to bring recognition to that fact as well. That watercolor painting by Native artists in the early 20th century wasn't exclusive to the Southwest, as in like the New Mexico area. Um, I think we're way beyond time, so I think we'll wrap it up. I, I kind of like Stephen Mopope's comment, painting is like breathing. I think that's a nice way to, to end the, um, the, the webinar. And 
I want to thank you, Mariah and Julia and Olivia, for all your hard work and for participating today and answering these questions. Thank you for all of you attendees who have asked really thoughtful and challenging questions. We appreciate your, um, your participation so very much. And if you're Again, if you're unable to visit the museum in person, I'd, I'd recommend that you take a look at the virtual tour. But otherwise, the, the exhibit will be up until January 17th, and we hope that you will be able to, to visit it. Um, thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to Dr. Jackson Rushing for his expertise and dedication to his students and the history of Native American art. Um, Jack, I don't think that anyone here could have done this without you, for sure, so thank you. Um, and finally, to all of our attendees, but especially to family members of the Kiowa Six um, and other Kiowa um, elders and attendees tonight, the museum, again, would like to see you in January. And, and I hope that you'll take the opportunity to reach out to us so that we can, we can contact you about that event. Um, but thank you, everybody, for all of your um, great questions and for listening in tonight. And we hope to see you at the next um, Zoom program. Thanks so much. Thank you.